Hello, everyone, and thank you all for calling in tonight to the Citronese cooking class with the Duke Asian Alumni Alliance. My name is Kelly Chang, and I am Trinity class of 2019, and I am DAAA's Vice Chair of Programming. Today, we're joined by Linda Yi, who is Trinity class of 2012, and Linda is the creator and CEO of Panda Cup Stories and Panda Cup Diner. And Linda here today will be leading us through the cooking class. And I wanted to once again thank everyone for calling in and spending, the, spending their Thursday evenings here with us. Um, and I'll pass it over to you, Linda, without further ado. All right, great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Hello and ni hao, everyone. Welcome to today's the Chuan 101 class, taught by me, Melinda, and Panda here. I am so excited to spend the next hour talking to you about my absolute favorite cuisine, which is uh, Sichuan food or Chuan Cai. Now, cards on the table, I am Sichuanese, so I was born in Chengdu, so this is a biased opinion, but hopefully by the end of this class, I will have done my job to convince you that Sichuan food is a cuisine worthy of daily consumption, if you do so choose to, um, because really family-style Sichuan cooking, which is what we're going to be talking about today, hits that sweet spot between healthy, um, nutritious, and delicious. So now you're probably also here because you want to roll up some sleeves and actually cook some of those dishes and um, avoid some of the maybe headaches or hiccups that might come along with uh, cooking a food that you are not familiar with, which, you know, given the poll respondents, that's maybe about half of you, which is really cool. So that is good to know. So now the class is not going to be for you if you, you know, accidentally stumbled your way in here and you hate spicy food, right? So we are going to be making chili oil and chili oil based sauce, um, or if you don't like free content, followed by a super valuable offer. So at the very end of class, I'll be opening up my Citron Cooking Club and Cup Diner for a lifetime membership. So I see that we have a few new people who have joined us. So ni hao and hello again. My name is Linda, and you might know me from my uh, bicultural webcomic that I illustrate called Panda Cup Stories, where I write about Chinese language, Chinese culture, Sichuan food, obviously, and also my journey with ADHD and mental health. So as of this year, I am also a small business owner and I run a Sichuan cooking club and e-course called the Panda Cub Diner. And this is where um, we will be drawing the recipes that we are learning today as well. So cards on the table, I am not a trained chef. I've never cooked in famous restaurants. I didn't go to culinary school. And actually for the large part of my adult life, I've had a pretty fraught relationship with food. So I loved eating it. Growing up, Food Network was always on um, in the background in my house, and I had a cookbook hoarding problem. So I probably still have 20 cookbooks on my bookshelf right now. But when it came to actually making food, that was a whole other story. So growing up, like growing up um, in a Sichuanese household, I would always cook alongside my parents and do tasks that were assigned to me. And I actually enjoyed that. But when I went to college, and especially after I left, um, dinner often looked like this rather than this, right? So PB&J and cold cereal for dinner. And so I soon became trapped really in this vicious cycle of my own making. And even though I you know, often longed for home-cooked meals I grew up with, I kept putting it off or I never got around to making it because I was either too drained, didn't have the ingredients, or I think like, honestly, I thought I sucked at cooking. And I told myself that cooking just wasn't for me, right? And at the time I had a partner who cooked all the time. So I leaned very heavily on him and probably kind of unfairly <laughs> gave him that share of the tasks. But this all kind of came to a head um, around the pandemic where I, you know, was alone in lockdown. There was what felt like, you know, a rising sweep of anti-Asian sentiment um, in the city specifically, and I got really homesick. So it was around this time where I started reconnecting with my family over food, um, over like copious WeChat texts about recipes and cooking over Zoom. So this basically birth the Panda Cup Diner, um, which is the business I run today. So the Panda Cup Diner is basically the solution I created when I streamlined my kitchen and also brain for Sichuanese cooking. So that really took me from dreading the kitchen to 
kind of having a life where now I have weekly sort of like dine in date nights where I cook with my partner. Um, I'm actually able to throw on the fly Sichuanese dinner parties, which is insane to me. And that used to require like months of planning. And I think most importantly, now that I am able to go home to Georgia to see my parents, uh, now that, you know, restrictions have eased, um, I'm able to cook them the meals that they lovingly prepared for me when I was a child. So if you are watching this now um, during the November 10th live stream, right, so if you're here, part of the Duke class, um, that is awesome. And if you have any questions going forward, uh, please plug them into the chat and we'll get to them at the very end. Um, or if you signed up for this webinar on my website, so um, this won't be me talking to you live, right? Because it's not November 10th, but um, they will be pre-scheduled and me and my assistant, me and my assistant will be in the chat answering your questions. So please pop in and say hi. So going forward, I'm going to share with you all of my family Sichuanese secrets so you can eat Sichuan food forever, or at least whenever you want. So we're going to start class off with a myth buster, which is that um, Chinese food in general is junky, super spicy, like too oily, and just in general, not a very healthy um, cuisine, which unfortunately is still an opinion that some people hold. Um, and we're also going to kind of talk about uh, Sichuan food and how the myth is that everything about Sichuan is spicy and mala, which is partially true, but not completely. So one of the reasons that I wanted to start here was this uh, article that came out over the pandemic was also one of the reasons that spurred me into this hyper-focus mode of researching and exploring and reconnecting with Sichuan food, which was this uh, New York Times article that was published where a hipster restaurateur um, announced that she and her husband were going to open a clean Chinese restaurant. So, you know, instead of the greasy junky stuff that most restaurants serve, they were going to improve it. And so I had some thoughts about this. Um, and as a comic artist, I partnered with another one of my favorite web comics. Um, if you're interested, her handle is Third Culture Chinese. And um, we responded to right the call of hashtag clean Chinese, um, in which case we said clean the toll. So for that particular comic, um, some people in the comments were like, you know, maybe Panda needs some anger management classes, to which I say, you know, fair. Um, but Panda's response would be maybe people need some Chinese food history classes. So that is actually where we're going to start before we roll up our uh, sleeves and get cooking. So we're going to start with a very brief dive into Chinese and Sichuan food history. So I'm going to hand the mic off to pre-recorded me. And let's get started. There is an old saying that goes, Nan tian, bei xian, dong la xi suan. I won't get into the weeds of exactly how accurate this is, but suffice to say that the tastes and traditions of Chinese cuisine are often influenced by geographic region. And what we call Sichuan food, or cui cai, comes from the southwestern region of China, which is the Sichuan province and Chongqing municipality. So si cui sun and Chongqing. And for reference, size-wise, Sichuan and Chongqing are around the same size as California plus New York State squished together. So about 219,000 square miles each. Fun fact, Chongqing used to be part of Sichuan province and was Chengdu, my hometown's rival for Sichuan's top culinary capital. However, now that it is its own municipality, it is no longer part of Sichuan, so Chengdu wins. <clears throat> Which is to say, culinarily speaking, Sichuan and Chongqing are still one family. So when we think of Sichuan food, that is the food that comes from Sichuan and Chongqing. Diverse as it is, if I had to summarize Sichuanese cuisine into one word, that word would be ma la or ma la. If you came into this course with even a general understanding of Sichuanese cuisine, you'll probably already be familiar with ma la. So ma la is literally translated into numbing and spice, or numbing spice, and it's this mouth-watering blend of spicy, zingy, tingly, and mouth-numbing flavor that is unique to Sichuan cuisine. 
The ma in mala means numbing, and this numbing sensation comes from the hua jiao plant. So hua jiao is literally translated as flower pepper, but in the West, it's more commonly known as the Sichuan peppercorn or prickly ash. This fragrant spice is the thing that causes that pins and needles feeling that dances on your tongue and lips. Apart from making your lips tingle, the Sichuan peppercorn is also a symbol of fertility in China because the plant bears a lot of seeds. So if you ever get the chance, to attend a wedding in Sichuan, particularly rural Sichuan, chances are that you will see the newlyweds showered with handfuls of peppercorn, Sichuan peppercorn, and peanuts. So this is very similar to the tradition of throwing rice on the couple in the West. So I guess no matter where you are, we love to scatter agricultural products to promote prosperity and fertility. No pressure, new couple. Now the la part of ma la means spicy or hot, and it also in slang usage means spicy or hot in terms of appearance. Um, anyway, this spice comes from the fiery red chilies that Sichuanese folk love to put in almost everything. And this actually has to do with where Sichuan is located. Sichuan is a beautiful province filled with majestic mountains and winding rivers, but it also happens to be very damp and chill in the winter and hot and muggy in the summer. So in traditional Chinese medicine, damp and chill is a big no-no. And this is because it is thought that chilly dampness really disrupts the delicate yin-yang balance of the body and can sap your energy and make you sick. So while in the West, we may swear by an apple a day keeping the doctor away. In Sichuan, it is thought that guzzling down flaming hot chilies to drive out the moisture and dispel the cold will help keep us healthy. And of course, that folk wisdom is around the same as apple day keeps a doctor away. So yes, eat as many chilies as you want, but also take your medicine. So uh, thank you, pre-recorded me. So that mala flavor profile that we talked about before um, is the flavor that Sichuan is famous for, right? Um, but that isn't the whole picture of Sichuan cuisine. So jia chang cai, jia chang cai, or family style cooking in Sichuan food really um, focuses on a balance and harmony of flavor, of color, um, and also taste. And so we're going to talk about this in a little bit later, but because this is a Sichuan 101 class, we are going to start with the most famous flavor, um, which is mala. So that brings us to our Mythbuster 2, which is to really achieve authentic Sichuanese flavor, right? Like a lot of people try, for example, to make dan dan mian as their first Sichuan dish, um, that this will require, you know, hours and hours of prep, you know, like, tens of twenties of ingredients that you'll probably never use again once you make the meal. And right, I, uh, nobody got time for that. It's quite daunting. And the thing is, I get it, right? So when we decide to explore a new cuisine that we love, we want to make what we know and what we're familiar with. But the problem is that a lot of the famous Sichuan dishes, the ones that you'll find in menus, aren't the most beginner friendly. So, for example, hui guo zou or hui guo zhou, which literally means twice cooked pork, very famous Sichuan dish. Um, but traditionally, how it was prepared was, you know, this pork is lovingly boiled um, and actually used as an ancestral offering. So for this photo is actually um, a offering for my grandmother who died many, many years ago. And so after she has had a chance to write feast on her favorite snacks, then we take this cut of pork back, slice it up, um, stir fry it with a number of like succulent sauces and leeks, and then we have a feast um, of our own as well. But if you wanted to tackle this traditional dish as your first attempt at Sichuan cooking, that's a whole day affair, right? And it's probably not where you want to start if you want to eat quickly. Now, um, another classic dish, uh, mapo dofu, which is actually a dish that I teach in Panic of Diner, but not until a little bit later, is another example of this. So it's a dish with a lot of different ingredients and more importantly, a lot of simultaneous steps, right? So if you don't kind of like handle that uh, balance carefully, your aromatics might burn and you're not going to end up with the dish that you love. And then there's the actual gathering of ingredients, right? Which for many of us in the West, there is something of a catch-22. So either you don't live in a major metropolis. So growing up, um, after being in Ellicott City, shout out to the person who was from Ellicott City, my family moved to Augusta, Georgia, um, which is a pretty 
small uh, city in Georgia compared to Atlanta. And so there we didn't have access to an Asian Mart and the international aisle was pretty teeny weeny. But then if you, you know, do drive a couple of hours to Atlanta, for example, to go to an Asian Mart, you know, you get brand paralysis, right? There's so much stuff to choose from. And so, you know, given the ingredient confusion, the loss at the market, the six hours of time commitment, um, it's no wonder that this can be daunting, right? So the good news is that we can start simple. So instead of all of the ingredients, all we need is what I call the Sichuan starter pack. So the Sichuan starter pack um, is basically these eight core ingredients, um, which are the ingredients that most family style Sichuan dishes are built upon, right? So with these eight core ingredients, you can combine them in a number of different ways for diverse flavor profiles. But the good thing is it takes a fraction of time to prep and cook. And the more you're familiar with them, the quicker it becomes. So for six of these ingredients, you can buy them at your local grocery store or at least get substitutes, right? So there are the aromatics, um, soy sauce, sesame oil. So Chinese black vinegar, you might have um, a harder time sourcing. You can definitely find it on Amazon. But if you're in a pinch, you can also substitute aged balsamic. Now, our chili oil and our Sichuan peppercorn, these are the two flavors that we are going to focus on now. So this is the left hand and right hand of the ma la, numbing and spicy flavor for the flavor profile that we were talking about before. So the ma, which is numbing and tingling, this flavor is um, thanks to the Sichuan peppercorn. And so the Sichuan peppercorn, you know, it looks like regular peppercorn, but it tastes quite different. And the traditional way of adding the ma flavor to dishes is you would toast your own Sichuan whole peppercorn and you would grind it into a very fine powder and then use that to sprinkle onto dishes, which is the way my family has made it for years. And in the full Panda Cup Diner Eat course, I do have a, a detailed tutorial on how to do that. And my, yeah, yeah, my grandfather actually teaches that lesson. So he's a guest instructor. Um, but for most beginners these days, I actually recommend um, getting Sichuan peppercorn oil instead. So hua jiao yu. Um, and this is actually something I've started to use more often as well. So it's a great substitute. Um, I almost wouldn't say substitute, like replacement. And it also offers kind of like a dose of numbness for a little bit of um, liquid. So 50 Hertz Foods has a really good product line. So class is not sponsored by them, but cards on the table. The CEO is a friend of mine, but they truly make really good product. So if you're interested, um, I would definitely give them a look. Now for the chili oil, um, you can definitely go buy store-bought chili oil in a pinch, but I highly recommend that you make your own. So this is the first official recipe that we will be making together. Handing it off to pre-recorded me and a very special sous chef. All right, so for our first recipe today, we are going to be making my family's five minute chili oil, um, which in Sichuanese, my family calls suyo hai jiao. Um, so hai jiao uh, is what Sichuan folk call chili pepper or la jiao. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So the first thing we're gonna wanna do is gather all of our tools of the trade here. Um, so we are going to want a ceramic bowl ideally with a lid. So as you will see here, um, I actually keep the majority of my chili oil in this giant ceramic jar. But today we are going to be making a special batch just for um, us folks here. So I'm going to use this ceramic bowl instead. Um, it doesn't have a lid, but I will be transferring it into a Tupperware after. So we're going to want our ceramic jar. We're going to want our wok and our ladle, which I have sitting over on my range. And of course, a spoon with which to stir and maybe a little helper that actually has opposable thumbs. So not this one, go away hell. All right, so once we have all of those tools in one place, we are going to first pre-measure out our ingredients. And as you see, this chili oil recipe is super simple. All we need is three things plus oil. And I'll also be talking about why that is as we are waiting for our oil to heat up later. 
Great. So in the recipe card that I will be sharing with you via email after this class, um, as well as the physical one, I will be shipping to you if you join Panda Cup Diner at the end of class. Um, you'll see that I actually have ingredients for a fairly large batch here. So the um, actual measurements aren't as important as the ratio. So basically you want a one-to-one -one ratio between the chili flakes and powder, and then kind of times two for how much oil. So so today in our class, we're actually going to be making a smaller batch. So we're just going to do half a cup of chili flakes down here. Um, waiting for it to focus. So half a cup of Korean chili powder, and then about three tablespoons to six tablespoons of white sesame seed. So you can also use black sesame seed. Um, this is for extra fragrance. Um, my family likes to use the white ones because it makes the chili oil look really pretty. All right, so once you have measured out all of your ingredients, it is time to assemble. So we are actually going to be assembling our dry ingredients in our bowl. So um, some recipes will call for you to heat the oil up and then add these into the oil. Um, the way my family does it, which I find a lot more simple and manageable, is to kind of layer it all in first. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take the Korean chili powder, which is a little less spicy and more fine, and we're gonna put it in our bowl, shake it flat. And then we are going to take the crushed red chili pepper, where you can, you can just find this at any old grocery store. So same thing, shake, put it in and shake it flat. So very important, don't mix anything yet. All you want to do is have it layered um, one on top of each other, like you're making sand art. And finally, the uh, sesame seed. So you want just enough sesame to cover the top. And so this could be, you know, how much you measured out. Um, it could be a little less. So that's about good for me. So I'm not going to use all of it. And now we are ready to start heating our oil. So again, at this point, don't mix this because when we start adding hot oil into our bowl, we want the sesame to fry first, right? So we want this to start sizzling and bring out the aroma um, before we start mixing and getting the chili to heat up. All right, so I'm going to bring us over to the range and we're going to start heating up some oil. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is turn my fire onto the highest setting. Okay, so now that we have our heat on, we are going to measure in our oil. So because we use the half a cup measurement for our dry ingredient, we are going to put in one E and about a half cup of vegetable oil. So I'm just using regular veggie oil here. You can use any oil, um, any neutral oil with a high smoke point. So it could be canola, you know, people traditionally use rapeseed oil in China. You can also use peanut oil. My parents have actually been using avocado oil recently. Oh, you can see my <laughs> tripod um, camera here. All right, so we're going to let it heat. And while that's happening, it's going to take you, you know, anywhere between probably two to three minutes um, if you're using my batch amount here, or if you're making a really large batch of chili oil, then your oil is going to take longer. So while we're waiting for that to heat up, so this isn't going to be ready yet, um, just for reference, the way you would check to see if your oil is hot enough is you're gonna scoop a little bit into your bowl, right? So right now nothing is happening. When your oil is hot enough, you want to see this start to sizzle, but not burn. So I'm gonna keep heating this oil. And while that is happening, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Sichuan food history with you guys. The chili pepper, which in Mandarin is called la jiao, la jiao, which is literally spicy pepper. In Sichuanese, however, chilies are called hai jiao or hai jiao. Hai jiao is the dialect pronunciation. And this literally translates as sea pepper. 
So growing up, I never really questioned why there was this difference, right? So, la jiao, hai jiao, potato, potato. But as it turns out, there is a historical reason for why we Sichuanese folk call chilies the peppers of the sea, or hai jiao. And this is because chilies are not actually native to Sichuan, which I didn't learn until I researched for this course. So in fact, the chili plant didn't reach China until the late 16th century, and it's thought that they were most likely brought over by ship by Portuguese traders. And actually, in those early days, the chili plant was admired for its beauty, right? So very white flowers, vivid scarlet red fruit, and it wasn't considered edible. So it wasn't until the turn of the 19th century that the chili, la jiao, or as Sichuanese call it, hai jiao, the peppers that came from the sea, became an established part of Sichuanese cuisine. I loved learning that such a core part of Sichuan food has foreign origins because to me it's yet more proof that cultural fusion leads to beautiful and yes, delicious things. Okay, let's try this. Oh, okay, so it's starting to sizzle. That is great. So I'll show this to you again, right? You see this sizzle start to happen. So now you are going to turn your heat down to a pretty low setting. So you basically want to keep this oil hot, but you don't want this to heat up anymore because any more is going to um, burn your sesame and burn your chili oil mixture. So now what you want to do is you're gonna wanna start scooping. Mm and mixing. So usually if I'm using a more narrow jar, I just scoop and mix at the same time. But here I'm going to want to make sure that all of my sesame fries first before I start to mix. And as a note, if I wasn't filming <laughs> this um, would be on the counter. I would not be holding it quite dangerously for the walk. So as a safety concern, um, just a note. All right. And once we have that initial fry down, super easy. We're just going to scoop and mix. Basically, you want to turn up the dry ingredients that haven't come into contact with the oil yet. So while this is happening, I'm going to include a little bit more citron food history. And this is definitely true during big celebrations like Chinese New Year. And indeed, that includes a lot of meat layered in a bunch of very fragrant but oily uh, sauces. And if you eat that every day, chances are your body is not going to thank you. But the thing is, like, Chinese people know this as well, right? It's not like we're having these types of lavish feasts every day. And so family-style Sichuan cooking, I would say, is in general just simpler, easier, just as flavorful, but in a more balanced way than maybe your um, typical banquet, right, setup. And it's also, you know, helpfully very easy to fit into a busy family lifestyle. And both of my parents worked really long hours. And so the dishes that we will be learning together were they were easy enough to both prep and put together and get to table um, within mostly 30 minutes because my parents would usually, if they were cooking, come home, the two of them would prep um, or one person would prep while the other person started to stir fry and then dinner would be ready. Right, so we are going to finish this up and set it aside to cool. And now we have our five minute chili oil. So again, we are waiting for this to cool. And I think for this batch, I am probably just gonna transfer it into one of these old Chinese takeout containers and bring it to my boyfriend's cause his supply is running low. Um, so right now it's still pretty hot, but just wanted to give you a look at the color. 
So the reason why um, we're making it first and then transferring it, obviously, is boiling hot oil into plastic is not ideal. Um, and if I was actually making it for myself, I would just be making it directly into my ceramic jar with a lid that my friend Annabelle made for me. So really, once it settles, the color is absolutely gorgeous. I know you can see. <laughs> like painting the walls red. Um, and really, I go through this so quickly. Um, I just made a batch actually about a week and a half ago, so I'm going to need to replenish. Um, and we will be using this chili oil sauce in our next recipe, which is going to be revealed in a second by the other me. All right, other me is back. Um, so that was my family's five minute chili oil. Um, and you may have noticed that it is much simpler than some of the other chili oil recipes out there. And we can talk a little bit in the Q and A about why that is if folks are interested. Um, but I'm going to move on to the next recipe, which is the one that I am probably more excited about. So the really cool thing about Sichuan cooking is that um, the dishes are cumulative, which means that once you master that first recipe, then you're already halfway there for the second one. So the next dish that I'm going to teach is actually this drizzle on anything panda sauce that uses that chili oil that we just made. Here we go. So for the second recipe of our class, we are going to be making my favorite sauce. Um, I call it drizzle on anything panda sauce, but my family actually just calls it xiang liao, which is literally a condiment in Chinese. So as always, um, I function best when I chunk steps, and this is also what I recommend new cooks in the kitchen do as well. So first, I gather all my tools. Usually, I have a cutting board and a cleaver um, for cutting up the scallions for garnish, but since we're a little tight on time today, I've done that beforehand. Um, in my live cooking classes, we'll do this together. Um, and then we'll move on to step two. So basically step two is mise en place in French, right? So we want to make sure that we have everything on hand and prepped. And for the panda sauce, that is really simple. We basically just pull out our citron starter pack that we talked about earlier. And to give you guys a look, um, I have my entire Sichuan starter pack <laughs> uh, in actually this little bamboo steamer for ease of access. So I used to keep these in my cabinet, but I find that actually for my ADHD, having it out and about um, makes me cook like three times more often than when I have it away. Um, and having it like together uh, keeps it quite tight. So let's just double check. Our ingredients so we want salt okay so sugar. instead of making you all double check with me um i will confirm that all of my ingredients were there and we can just skip to mixing the sauce all right so i'm going to be making one serving of this panda sauce um, and i'm going to put it on the noodles i've prepped here but actually what i've taken to doing is i've made giant batches so basically this serving times eight at the beginning of the week. And I just keep it in a little, you know, like old ice cream container and I shake it up and I use it throughout the week. All right, so we're gonna start with our dry ingredients first. Pinch of salt. And we are going to do a teaspoon of sugar so I'm actually going to be using my teaspoons and tablespoons today, although these aren't actual real measuring spoons. And if you've ever cooked with an Asian parent, you'll know that they will laugh at this. And honestly, sometimes I don't use measurements anymore because I've gotten quite confident at making the sauce. But when you're learning, I think it's super helpful to have everything broken down and um, Asian parents aren't the great at teaching it. So in terms of our Sichuan Ma flavor, if I use the peppercorn powder, I would probably shake like three shakes in. The peppercorn oil is quite potent. So I am actually only going to put about half a teaspoon. I'm just gonna guesstimate how much that is. 
And if I need more, I can always add it. So then we're going to add our chili oil. So the chili oil amount is really up to you. So I like mine quite spicy. So I usually put in two full tablespoons. So you see the gorgeous red color here. And if I wanted it really spicy, I would dig to the bottom and bring up some sediment. I just realized it was not focused. Um, but I think today I'm not going to have that much sediment because I want my noodles to mix. My noodles are dry. Um, if this was a soupy noodle, I would probably put more sediment in. And then we are going to put our sesame oil. So one teaspoon of this guy here. And our two big ol' brown boys, soy sauce and vinegar. So we're gonna start vinegar, or sorry, start with soy sauce, So we're gonna want about two tablespoons I always go a little bit extra with my soy sauce, um, which I should probably change soon. <laughs> Too much sodium is not great. And then um, one teaspoon of Chinese black vinegar. And again, you can also adjust this according to taste. So I find that with these measurements, one teaspoon gives it a nice like acidic pop, but it doesn't make the sauce like sour right, or sun la, hot and spicy is another flavor profile. So if you wanted that, you could add more. And then, for example, some people don't like the taste of vinegar, my baba being one of them. So when um, I used to make his sauce for him as a kid, we would just skip that step. All right. Okay, oh my gosh, that's such a gorgeous, gorgeous color. All right, so now our sauce is ready. And all we need to do is drizzle it on our dish. And so for the panda sauce, um, it's like the first time you learn it, it might be a little complicated, right? Because it's a bunch of different ingredients. But once you're done, it's like fi chang shang shou. So <laughs> I'm going to put a bunch of scallions in. Because I love these. <laughs> All right, and this is a very simple meal that I will often make for myself um, if I'm just, you know, working from home. And you can also replace the noodles right with rice, and then just put in some pre-browned meat. Um, I don't think I clarified this was a ground chicken <laughs> that I had. Um, so I am now going to mix it up. Ah, look at that color. And actually put this aside for dinner. Okay. There we go. All mixed. Let me give it a taste test. And for, um, if anyone is wondering, this is actually angel hair pasta. So if I want to cook noodles, mm, it's so good. I'm so happy with the sauce. Um, so um, I, I think I got really distracted by the noodles and I never finished my um, actual, doo -doo 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 actual sentence so what i was saying was this pasta is actually angel hair pasta which is obviously not a traditional um chinese ingredient but if you want to pre-prep cold noodles and just you know like bring it out and pop some sauce in then angel hair pasta is really really great and can keep for days um you just want to sprinkle some oil in it uh before you know it completely cools down so um that was our second recipe of the day. And if you, I saw some comments um, when I was switching between videos to the screen that you're hungry again, well, you can make the sauce. Um, I'll be sending along this recipe as well in the follow-up email. 
if you signed up for this webinar on my website. And if you're here live for the Duke event, they will also be sending out um, these recipes as the follow up email as well. So now that we have made right our drizzle on anything panda sauce, this really unlocks um, an entire dinner party's worth of dishes. So this is not all of them. These are only four, right? So it goes great on dumplings. Um, if you want sort of a lighter version, you can put it on some chopped up cucumber, add some garlic for a flavor twist. Uh, steamed eggplants is another great option. And then cold tossed chicken is absolutely divine. So basically, right at this point, you will have seen that citron food is very much, you know, first you toddle, then you walk, and then you master these recipes and off you go, right? You can have citron food whenever you want, except that's not always the case. So all of this stuff that we just covered, right? The chili oil, the sauce, all of these dishes, um, I knew. I grew up in a Sichuan household. I helped my parents make these. And actually, when I was um, in middle school and high school, I'd made some of these dishes myself. But for most of my 20s, despite knowing all of this, this is what life uh, mostly looked like. So empty pantry, empty fridge, because I forgot to go grocery shopping again this week. And I got home. It's been a long day of work. So I'm really tired, right? Do I even want to go to the store? So it's at a point where even ordering out feels exhausting, right? Let alone going out to the grocery store again. And so paralyzed by choice, I sit my butt down, pull up Netflix, and two hours later, I realize that everything is closed, nothing to deliver anymore, and it's cereal for dinner again. So this is um, kind of where I want to share for the rest of the class um, some discoveries I made from going from someone who didn't cook at all, right, and thought that just for me, cooking was a disaster, to cooking almost every week and loving it. And this brings us to really the last and final myth of class, which is cooking is not just about the how-to, right? It's about the things that um, get, in, or it's about getting rid of the things that get in the way. And this really is also my specialty as a cooking coach. And it's how I've taught myself to cook with my ADHD. And this informs a lot of the way that I teach. And so the thing is, you know, we're not, um, at a loss for information, right? It's the opposite problem. There's almost too much out there. So case in point, hundreds of cookbooks, actually thousands are published each year. And for years, I was the top consumer of these cookbooks, right? And usually at the beginning of the year, but then this happens. So I pick a recipe, I'm excited about it. It's new, it's fun. And then there are so many ingredients I don't have because I don't cook often enough. So I go to the store, maybe get some brand paralysis, grab all of those ingredients, finally bring them home. You know, I prep, I cook, I eat. At that point, I'm not even enjoying it because I'm so tired and then I still have to clean up. And by then, I spent $80 an entire day, and I'm supposed to do this every day, right? Like, what? And so in my mid-20s, when I was trying to cook and trying to get my life together, um, it would look like me attempting a big, lavish meal, usually following through with it, but then spending months right back where I started. And this just made me feel really sad, right? Because I, you know, was thinking, like, I am going to grow up and I'm not going to be able to pass sort of like the foods that I love, um, the foods that my parents like made me to show their love to my kids because, you know, I guess I'm just a lazy person who can't get her shit together. Right. And that was really the self-taught self-talk that I had for years. And um, this really changed when I got my ADHD diagnosis in my mid twenties. Um, and this kind of resulted in also an aha moment that birthed the panic of diner, which is for a lot of us, right? So it might be you, it might be a partner, it might be an older child um, who struggles in the kitchen, you know, laziness or even lack of knowledge is not necessarily the issue. So it's actually because even if we know how to do it, right? It's like, 
throwing you into a master chef pantry where, you know, there is every possible ingredient at your fingertips. And then I tell you to bake a cake, but I don't actually specify which ingredients you need um, or what recipe that you're following or what step to do what in. So kind of, you know, learning how to cook as an adult, if you weren't already sort of scaffolded through that um, as a child, this is kind of what it feels like, right? All of these tasks come out of the woodwork. And so this is where I think like um, I had an aha moment with a ADHD coach of mine, which she was like, well, you know, like all of the executive function struggles that uh, neurodivergents um, str like struggle with, uh, all of these things are exactly what cooking requires, right? And it's not even necessarily an ADHD thing when it comes to cooking, because even for someone who, you know, might not have an ADHD diagnosis, uh, we are often tired, busy, and overworked at the end of the day, which also happens to be dinner time, right? When we think about, oh, like, we should probably start cooking something now. So at the end of the day, we're overwhelmed with decision fatigue. And the last thing we want to do is burn even more brain calories, trying to decide what to make, scroll through all of this fluff on, you know, like blog recipe posts in order to get to the recipe. And then like once you actually find a recipe, all of this stuff comes out of the woodwork and it's just so unappetizing as an activity. So the good news is that if you are watching this right now, right, it means that you're interested in food, you're interested in making food, and you're interested in exploring something that you don't um, already have mastery over. So this desire to make a delicious meal at home is really the key. And all we need is a little extra help to get us going, right? To get the momentum going. So part of that is curation, right? We don't want all the information. Actually, what we want is the strategic basic steps to start with, to get the most bang for our buck. Um, we want that information structured in a way that makes sense, right? So um, basically do lessons, um, or I guess is to teach. So you want to scaffold your way up to mumble dofu. And also, most importantly, or not most importantly, but just as importantly, we want to actually schedule it into our calendars instead of getting to do it, um, getting to it one day. So this was basically the hyper focus project that I had during the pandemic, where I dove all in to research um, all of this as it pertains to Sichuan food, kind of digging into my family archives as a uh, resource. And this is what kind of became the Pandagup Diner, which is um, what I'm going to introduce now. So if you also want some solid cooking skills, some delicious date night routines, and um, easy to maintain kitchen strategies with an added bonus of delicious Sichuanese, I'm going to break it all down for you um, in these last couple minutes of class. So I call this the Panda Cup Diner system, and I want to give you a quick bird's eye view of it, because um, even if you don't end up joining Panda Cup Diner, this is something that you can take and implement in your own life, right? Um, uh, just kind of as a do-it-yourself model. So these are what I call four stepping stones to going from, you know, like, being a stressed out cook who wants to make something beautiful in the kitchen to actually having it a joyful part of your life. So the first thing um, is actually, it doesn't really have anything to do with cooking. It's a strategy thing. So it's to separate the um, ne necessary act of feeding ourselves um, versus the interesting activity of learning to cook. And the old approach, right? What we talked about was, deciding to learn something new when we're already hungry, when we're already tired, and um, we basically have the cards stacked against us. So the new method is to divide and conquer, right? So what I encourage um, my students to do is use this, I call it like a three date night um, in one formula to divide and conquer, yes, but have fun, right? Like um, in have fun as well. Sorry, sorry, a little brain fart, but I'll clarify. So basically, you know, imagine that you want to make um, the chili oil and panda sauce and basically this cold tossed chicken dish on Sunday. 
and um, you know exactly what ingredients you need. So on Friday, you go, you pick up all of those ingredients and you maybe get a treat for yourself, right? Your favorite flavor of Ben and Jerry's, bottle of wine. And then that night you don't cook, right? So you have already done the prep work of cooking on Sunday and you feed yourself, right? And treat yourself to take out that dessert you got and be at home. So that's date night number one. Um, date night number two, I suggest is, you know, for example, on Saturday, have a tidy party, right? Like um, book a time with your partner or your friends and clean the kitchen um, because, you know, you don't want to come to Sunday and have a messy kitchen that is not inviting. So you do that and maybe you go out to dinner to celebrate again. So separating, feeding yourself from prepping to cook. And finally, your cooking date arrives, right? So um, this is when you have your Food Network dream montage, right? You go pick up some flowers, wine for the table, maybe a new tablecloth, and then you follow these step-by-step tutorials, maybe use some of my recipe cards to whip up that delicious meal. And then this kind of transforms what would have been a very stressful one-day activity into this lovely kind of three-day um, date night or family activity in one. So um, I wanted to share a little piece of feedback from one of my students. So Alex, um, her husband is actually from Chongqing, right? So the Chengdu culinary rival. Um, and for her, uh, Chinese date night has become a weekly thing. So she actually went from not thinking she could cook anything Chinese to being really proud of her mapo tofu. And her husband has also started to prep the cucumber dish. All right. So the second um, stepping stone is what I call order times two. So it's order in two senses of the word. So first, it's literally you're going to want to order your tools, right? Because, you know, you have to have a wok before you season it, before you stir fry something. And so for this, um, if you're in Panda Cub Diner. Oops. Sorry, guys. So you would come here where the roadmap is already light, like laid out for you. And you can also pull up, you know, either a linked shopping list to just plug and play, put those things in the cart and buy. Um, or there's also an Excel version of this as well. And so once you have right ordered all of your equipment and you're waiting for it to show up, then this is also where we do the second part of the order equation, which is you know order and tidy your space. And the reason why I include this here, even though it doesn't really have anything to do with the act of cooking, is that often we avoid cooking not because we hate the activity itself, but rather because tasks surrounding cooking can really drain our motivation, right? So who wants to cook with a dull knife, dirty dishes in the sink, and do I need a wok? How do I season it? So I guess I'll cook later becomes, you know, you just don't cook at all. So again, this is all about carving out a space to have that happen um, before you actually try and tackle cooking. And what I really like to do is pair maybe a not so compelling task with a reward. All right. And um, as a last note, there's also a great uh I guess I call it hack, but it's also a strategy called body doubling that's very effective for ADHDers, but I think um, is effective in general for people, uh, for general accountability. So this is when you either invite a friend over to come clean with you, or you can actually go to websites like Focusmate and book a one hour productivity session with a random stranger. And basically what you do is you sign on, you tell each other what your goals are. So, you know, You'll be like, I want to clean my kitchen. And then that person's like, I want to write, you know, the first chapter of my thesis proposal. And then you proceed to ignore each other for an hour and both of you come back um, super proud of your productivity. So just a hack. And um, this was something that one of my students, Howie, found really helpful as someone who was a complete newbie and quite daunted um, in the kitchen. So this strategy made the experience um, much more approachable and uh, and possible, basically. So a tidy kitchen basically is a welcoming space and your kitchen is now your canvas so you can let your creativity flourish. 
Speaking of creativity, the dishes that I um, invite everyone to make is actually these six building block dishes, right? So hearkening back to the myth number two that we talked about during class, um, I recommend not starting with the classics, but actually starting with very strategic base uh, strategic dishes that build into each other. So we've already learned two of them today, right? And if um, you are in the Panic Up Diner library, you'll see that these two um, are part of a one week meal plan that will basically plan out all of your meals for that week, but also uh, take you along a little citron cooking. Boot so a lot of thought went into choosing these six practice dishes for um, Panic of Diner or building block dishes. And as a note, um, Panic of Diner is not just six recipes. Uh, there is a whole growing recipe library um, with about 20 recipes thus far, adding every month. Um, as well as a masterclass archive. But to give you an idea of what these building block dishes look like, we've actually already done two of them, right? So the chili oil as well as the panda sauce. And so this is a suggested weekly meal plan. So kind of, you know, maybe do this during the holidays. It's a Sichuanese um, culinary boot camp, but easy mode. And each dish um, lays the groundwork for the next one. So that, for example, was the cold toss chicken, which is half a rotisserie chicken plus our panda sauce and some tingly peanuts. Um, and for example, like for that dish, we save half of that chicken so that later on in the week, we can make this recipe, which is called a uh, fish fragrant chicken slivers. And the last part of kind of this equation is making cooking right, or exploring a new recipe, whether it be exploring a new recipe or going back to an old one, a um, constant thing. So uh, whether that is a date night with a partner or a family activity with the family, what we want is to create either a monthly or a weekly event that is easy, interesting, and social. So you can either plan this on your own, right? Or you can let Panda plan for you. So this November, the one that I'm planning is this century egg and pork congee pita and shorojo class that I'm actually co-teaching with Made With Lao. And so these, um, you know, for us, little master's classes are group date nights. Um, and I have a lot of actually like couples join um, and families join. And it's this like cozy, intimate atmosphere of learning a new dish, but also hanging out with uh, fellow foodies. And there's a new dish every month, um, usually something that I am interested in trying, uh, but sometimes we vote on dishes. And these master's classes are always on the last week of the month on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays so that people know when to expect it. And um, if they don't uh, managed to make it live. This is also saved in the library of the Panic Up Diner. So um, I wanted to share the last piece of uh, feedback that I really loved. So Rob, his wife is from Wuhan, and she, um, according to him, had very high standards for his cooking, but she was quite um, happy with the Citron style tofu and cucumber that he made during class. And of course, I am an artist at heart and I love creating um, things that people can take home with them. So after every class, you get these beautifully illustrated recipe cards um, as a memento, um, but also a useful um, reference so you can make this dish again. So if you take anything away from this webinar, it's that you can make cooking, whether it's cooking Sichuanese or cooking any other cuisine, a joyful part of your life, no matter how daunting it can seem at times. So the big question now is how can you apply this framework to your own life, right? And create a system that makes cooking your favorite dishes a joy instead of a chore. So if you're also excited to embark on this guided journey to reconnect and master your favorite dishes while also rediscovering the joys of creating um, your favorite foods at home, then I am so excited to welcome you to join the Panda Cub Diner. So I will be putting the uh, sign up link, which is going to have a very special thing that I will talk about later um, in the chat soon. But before I do that, I just want to give you a bird's eye view of what you'll get immediate access to. So you'll know if this is an investment that um, is good for you.
So there are three parts that you will get access to inside the Panica Diner if you liked, you know, the taste of what you got today in a class and want the full experience. So the first is the Panica Diner e-course, which I also call the Pokedex. So this is basically the self-paced video um, do-it-yourself e-course that is your custom roadmap that transforms, you know, all of this wilderness into a step-by-step -step thing. All right. And so the everything that we talked about today is organized um, for you with a personalized progress tracker. So the second thing that you get access to in addition to the Panda Cub Diner is the monthly masterclass. So if the Panda Cub Diner e-course is your Pokédex, um, if you don't play Pokemon, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's going to get super nerdy up in here. Um, then your master classes are basically your traveling companions, right? Except instead of training Pokemon, we will be training ourselves to make delicious dishes every month. And these classes are totally free for members. Um, they're $30 a la carte. And the last thing that you get is just for people watching the live stream today. So either you're here for the Duke event on November 10th, or you signed up on my website. And this is basically um, my 12 recipe card deck. So this is kind of the crowning jewel of my work for this year. Every single recipe I have developed, um, I've made into a recipe card one every month. And now at the end of the year, I'm excited to share it with you. And so this is essentially sort of the um, in-game special event prize version of uh, my course, since I'm already committed to this whole video game RPG metaphor, um, except it's only available if you show up right at a certain place at a certain time. So, you know, kind of like in um, Pokemon Gold, where you can only get that Moonstone from the Tuchel Fairies at Mount Moon on Monday, you can only get the recipe cards today. So the doors are officially open for Panda Cup Diner. So for the last minute um, of the presentation, I just wanted to walk you through the investment um, that you would be making and what you would get. So in total, what you would get is the Pentecup Diner Self-Study eCourse, which is normally $297. And then you also have actually lifetime access to these monthly live stream cooking classes, which is a value of $360 a year. And just for today, um, I am also offering the physical 12 recipe card deck, um, which I actually don't sell online. So I only sell these for $10 a pop at physical New York art pop-ups. So if you want them all at once, um, today is the only time to get it as a bonus. So the total value is $777, but the uh, price for today is $249. So because I truly believe in what I've created and if this resonated with you at all, um, I really want you to feel confident about investing in this so that you can bring more joy and deliciousness into your life. So I am offering a one-year money-back guarantee because I know that not everyone can start immediately, right? Maybe you have some traveling coming up or it's in the middle of midterms if you're a graduate student, um, but you know that, you know, you might want to dig to this, dig into this during the holidays or during like a sabbatical. Then as long as you start the program um, anytime within the next uh, year and you don't like it, for whatever reason, I would happily give you your money back. So in the end, Panda Cup Diner began as a way to teach myself how to make my family's food. And it's grown into something so much more than just a how-to cooking class. So it's become a roadmap for me to break that cycle of dependence on takeout and meal kits, right? So I used to subscribe to Blue Apron, which um, was kind of a never-ending fee. Uh, and since creating the diner, it's kind of become my own duty friend and I only had to invest one year of time. Um, so in the end, I hope that my program will help support you as well in building a lifestyle that frees you to relish the food that you love to eat. And at the end of the day, Panic of Diner is a love letter to my mama, my baba, and also my yaya, my grandfather, who taught me how to take joy in eating and now making our family's food. So these are the dishes and stories that I want to pass on to my own kids, and I'm so excited to share it with you. 
And so the doors are officially open. Um, if you are interested in more details, the special link is in the chat. And that is the one that includes all of the fast action bonuses. And so um, I know we are a little bit ending late. So Kelly, let me know if you still want to do the Q&A. Um, I'm happy to stay on uh, if you would like to. Um, but if not, you know, thank you everyone for coming. And I can't wait to see what you create. Yes, Linda, thank you. Um, I actually was able to follow along and make the chili oil and make the panda sauce. Oh, amazing. Um, I think to be mindful of everyone's time, um, we had one question come in, which was, yeah. uh, do you have any restaurant recommendations in the Durham Raleigh Triangle area? Ooh, okay. Um, so I haven't lived in Durham Raleigh for a while. So I moved at the end of 2019, but um one of my favorite Citron restaurants was Gourmet Kingdom in uh, Hillsboro, I think. It's like right across the street from Cat's Cradle, if you know where that is. Um, yeah, so so that is kind of like my, my go-to uh, classic Citron restaurant. But since then, I don't know, like other stuff might have opened. So I would definitely explore. Um, and if you're not specifically looking for Sichuanese, like the M restaurants have always been great. So like M Sushi, M Coco, um, I think he opened another one. Hopefully they're still around. Um, I know the pandemic closed a lot of doors, but yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Linda. And thank you everyone for joining in tonight on this Thursday night. Um, I encourage everyone to make sure that their information is up to date in the Duke Alumni Network um, and stay tuned for future DAAA events. Thanks, everyone.